Hello, everyone. Gary here with a special supplement to The Filter. Recently, I had the opportunity to sit down with Victor Tron. Victor is a core developer for the Ethereum project. Essentially, he is a paid developer for the Ethereum Foundation. He's been around Ethereum since the very beginning of Ethereum. Even before the crowd sale took place, he was an active developer on the project. And after the initial funds raise for Ethereum, he became a paid developer for the Ethereum Foundation. So he's got a lot of insight, a lot of inside Ethereum information to share. We covered a lot of that ground during our talk, and uh, I'm going to share that talk with you right now. We covered Austrian economics, the birth of Bitcoin, smart contracts. Uh, essentially, we talked about what it's like to be involved with a large open source crypto development effort. Uh, since beginning with Ethereum, Victor has gone on to specialize in the Swarm sub-project within Ethereum. We talk a little bit about what uh, Swarm is and how that works. And uh, even towards the end of the interview, we, we talk uh, philosophically about what the world's going to be like when smart contracts are able to uh, essentially serve as a public good for humanity. You're going to want to stick around to the very end. I hope you enjoy this talk as much as I did. Uh, I'm just going to let it play. I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Well, I have to admit that I, I come from like, it's, it's come from many uh, ideological and political interest or leanings. I've always been interested in freedom and uh, uh, read a lot about Austrian economy and, and uh, kind of had, had quite wild visions of stateless society and, and, uh, and uh, a free, free market, uh, freed markets and freed people. And uh, from that uh, side, it was, it was, I, I found a group of like-minded people in Hungary who we had a Facebook group with. And uh, I, think, I think one of those people introduced me first to, to, to Bitcoin. I think I heard about it before as well, but it's kind of, you know, I, I, I didn't really, probably I didn't even really understand what it, what it was, or I thought it was just another PayPal or something like that. It's just kind of a passing, passing uh, news to me. And when, when one of these uh, people really introduced me and then convinced me to, to, to read about it, I, I it's, history began, so to say. Like I got, I got really, really intrigued by the, by the technology and as well as the, the societal in implications of, of using Bitcoin and, and decentralized currency. Uh, to be honest, this, this time was pretty much the time when I, shame on me to, to say, but when I really started to understand what money was. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe some of you can relate to that, because like Bitcoin is, is or, or the, the avenue of like learning what money is through Bitcoin is, is quite a common avenue to, mo to a lot of people. And uh, so I started reading about it. I started, you know, understanding all the uh, the relations with, uh, you know, central banks and how how money is issued and all the debt based economy, and 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 what sound money was. And I got intrigued by the by the by the notion and and um, by the by the concept of Bitcoin, which allows for like, uh, you know, con controlled inflation and and uh, a, 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 a digital. Um, algorithmic way to, to provide scarce resource as, as, the, as the sound basis of money. And, uh, yeah, so I, I, got, I got involved in I was on an intellectual as well as kind of practical level because I, I bought into it. Not that I had a huge wealth and fortune to spend on it, but just kind of started playing. And then I kind of went down the slippery slope and started started buying a uh, started, started my mining operation in the corner of my living room. So I, I did some mining in uh, starting starting early 2013 when it was still uh, possible. Uh, well, it's still possible. It's yes. just not viable, <laughs> or not profitable. But uh, at that time, I, I, I made some you know some reasonable profit on on, on mining and. And that, that drew me more, more and more into the, into the, the crypto world and crypto sphere. And did you already have the technical background, the programming and uh, computer? 
Oh, oh well, so I, I started hacking and, and, and programming when I was when I was twelve. So I, I was I've always been a geek, really. I published my first uh, little computer game in a in a in a child's magazine in like I think it was 1986. But uh, in between, there was a there was a bit of a hiatus. I have to say, I my my university degrees were were in math and 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 I did computational linguistics mostly as a as that was my career. So uh, I, I was I was working for uh, I was working in academia and research for a while as well, and after that. Um, Worked for worked for a company doing speech recognition and and uh, I was I was working a lot in the computational linguistics and natural language processing uh, uh, excellent, excellent. domain. So you 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 already had the technical background, the technical chops to get involved, and you also had the political leanings and the appreciation from a um, a macroeconomic standpoint of maybe what Bitcoin could. Represent pretty much, and uh, it's and I'm, I'm I'm very grateful for the current situation that these two things, like my professional skills and interest and like geekiness, <laughs> as well as my my ideological leanings and my my aspirations to change the, change the world to a better place, kind of align in such a stellar and beautiful way, and and it's 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 I'm, I feel really lucky to be part of this game. Yes, I think we're all very lucky to to live during this time where we're going to see well there's the the possibility for such profound things to change in the world. Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about it a bit more <laughs> detail. So. so that's how you you said that you came across Bitcoin through some of your colleagues, some of your friends introducing you to it and you had that moment where you dug in and really started to appreciate exactly what we have here. Yeah. In Bitcoin, you started mining. You started getting, uh, you know, playing yeah. with the technology a little bit. Yeah, playing with it, and I have to say, it was not, it was not an easy ride to, to understand the blockchain and and uh, all the different aspects of why it works. Actually, requires quite a bit of math background. I mean, if you really want to understand the depth of it, and um, of course, since then I went through like various, um, you know stages of having to explain it to people and like <laughs> dumb it down and try to make people understand like the, the gist of it from you know, pe people of various backgrounds and um, but, but to understand it myself I, I really had to do a lot of reading and um, I, I at the time I was still working in in, um, in like I, I was working for the BBC as well for a, for a while on a on a semantic web related project and um, Shall I talk about how I how I got into Ethereum, right? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what so, I so I was I was an avid follower of, of everything Bitcoin to be honest. I was I was uh, there was a there was a period of when, when I was so fascinated I was I was living and breathing Bitcoin really. I was I, I read every article about it. I I supported the one of these early um, documentary Films like uh, Life on Bitcoin. These these two guys, newlywed couple, try to live on Bitcoin for hundred days. I, I I supported them on Kickstarter and um, also followed the uh, all kind of Bitcoin podcasts and and video casts and uh, and of course went to uh, social meetups, uh, especially the ones in in London and. Uh, I was following also the Bitcoin conference in, in, in Miami, which uh, Vitalik first presented the Ethereum on. It was late 2013, December. And right after that, there was a Coin Scrum meetup, if I remember correctly, in London. It was, I think it was January or February, early February, no, no uh, in 2014. And that's when I uh, uh, really first heard about Ethereum live. It was uh, it was Dr. Gavin Wood, one of the three uh, main founders of Ethereum, who spoke about it, and it was it was it was actually even more intriguing than Bitcoin, and and and, and it was just it was just fantastic he to hear like all the opportunities that the blockchain technology opened up, and um, I immediately got uh, hooked on it, and went up to went up to Gavin and asked how I could contribute. I immediately cut my hours at the BBC for two, <laughs> three days a week, and like uh, jumped into it as 
with just you know volunteering as as any open source project would and uh, yeah that's 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 how that's how it went for me with ethereum and um well uh tell me why is ethereum more even more intriguing than bitcoin because a, a lot of a lot of people listening may not know exactly what ethereum is so satoshi nakamoto's invention uh bitcoin uses uh uh a very interesting experiment basically he uh, he capitalizes on a lot of uh, earlier uh, inventions relating to you know proof of work and and uh, and decentralized consensus however his his uh, his invention really puts uh, the economic incentive of miners in 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 as as part of the part of the the workings of the system and uh, it's an, it's a very interesting experiment of of, of uh, making a making a decentralized uh, decentralized money and uh, uh, basically do away without centralized control and a trusted third party in in a in an in an area where you need consensus that's this is the crux of bitcoin and uh, you can go a step further and and ask yourself whether whether we could generalize this notion and not only uh, use the, the this this opportunity to have decentralized consensus to to currency and and basically financial transfer of value, uh, but also on, also in other areas where you need consensus, and uh, that's that's what Ethereum really is a generalization of of everything that. That might need decentralized consensus. It's, it's basically a word computer that uh, allows you to do secure computation and uh, have a network of nodes agree on this computation in, without any trusted third party or intermediary. Yes, it's quite fascinating. And um, I think it's interesting to see that there are other applications besides. Uh, for money and financial transactions for this uh, distributed consensus, this yeah. worldwide computer that you describe uh, where the computations are reached by consensus. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, m maybe maybe another way to understand this is like if you use the metaphor that Bitcoin is, is basically an, an Excel spreadsheet and uh, Ethereum is the next spreadsheet with macros. So wh what do I mean by that? So you can conceptualize Bitcoin as basically a, a database of uh, balances or, you know, account balances. It's an open ledger where, you know, everyone's uh, current balance is kept mm -hmm. in, in an open ledger. And that's the database that you should ag agree on. Because ultimately what, what, what is money or what is digital money is, is nothing else but, you know, a record of, who 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 owns how many, and the, and the problem is of course that you know since digital uh, information is is virtually costless to copy, then I can always make another a, a different version of that database saying that I don't own one bitcoin but I own one million. The question is like you you will say oh no no but it's not true like you don't have one million so we have to reach a, a consensus about whose database is right, and that's exactly what Bitcoin achieves. So basically a uh, you have this Excel spreadsheet of, of of balances and the decentralized consensus mechanism that's behind blockchain technology and that's mining uh, basically brings about is is uh, is responsible for guaranteeing that that consensus can be reached. And what are the con what are the trans transactions in Bitcoin? They're basically just rearranging the values in the in the rows of that Excel spreadsheet. These are financial transactions of money transfer. So if you have uh, two rows in the extra spreadsheet saying Gary has two bitcoins and Victor has three bitcoins and the transaction is like I'm sending you one bitcoin, then what happens is you know, the system subtracts one bitcoin from my account, I will have uh, two. two and Gary will have three. And uh, a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we can actually do this transfer <laughs> after. And <laughs> And wh how Ethereum is, is different in, in if, you, if you use this metaphor is that Ethereum uh, allows you to have a lot more sophisticated database and the database also contains not only balances but uh, 
these objects called smart contracts sitting on the accounts. So what are smart contracts? Smart contracts are uh, essentially a piece of code, a pi a, a, any kind of script that you can think of uh, like written in any programming language. And, and the transactions are nothing else but uh, instructions to execute a certain uh, smart contract or script sitting on an account with specific input parameters that you send in the transaction. So for example, you can have an account which says, which is the contract code multiple by seven. So if you send it a transaction that has input data six, then the then the uh, when 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 you execute the transaction, this input data six will be multiplied by seven and results in forty two. And let's say the value is stored in the in the blockchain. Uh, of course, this is just a silly example, but maybe maybe it's, it illustrates like that you can have arbitrary computations is, uh, uh, as opposed to just uh, just uh, tr transfer of value executed on the on the blockchain. And and uh, just to mention so how it works so wh when i say that a certain computation executes uh, this essentially means that uh, ethereum is 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 a virtual machine it's like a it's like a word computer and these these computations are actually executed on each and every uh, node or client running the ethereum software so the computations are unimpeachable. Because yes, correct. And that's the that's uh, what the I gather is some of the value of the Ethereum network is you've got this consensus view of a of a certain calculation. Yeah, right? correct, correct. And so 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 Ethereum is uh, is the ultimate generalization of, of the blockchain technology because you can have. Uh, so I I don't know for your technical audience it's uh, it's basically a, a Turing complete programming language that uh, you can write any program in and these programs can sit as accounts on the on the ethereum blockchain and this can be executed by the transactions so would it be fair to would it be fair to call it a world computer that runs on cryptocurrency yes correct uh, i mean we, we, there's one very important detail that we haven't mentioned yet is uh, why why Ethereum actually needs a currency, or what was the what's the point of having a, a built-in uh, underlying currency in Ethereum? Because that's what it, it basically has, and that's why some people also think about it as an as an altcoin, so to say. So the underlying currency of Ethereum is Ether. It's called Ether, and the 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 ultimate value of Ether is. It, 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 you can also say that, that there's, there was a lot of debate in the Bitcoin world whether Bitcoin has an, has an intrinsic value, so to say. With, with, with Ether, you can understand this intrinsic value a little bit better because you can think of Ether as the crypto fuel that drives the execution of these smart contracts. This, this sounds a bit outlandish, so let me explain what this means. So in order to uh, avoid DDoS attacks to the network, or like spamming the network with spurious transactions, um, and also to to guarantee that certain computations are not running forever, we have uh, we have this uh, system whereby each operation of the virtual machine, each step of the computation, when executed, basically takes money out of your pocket, so to say. So when when a transaction is sent to an account, then the transaction sender sender's account is is billed uh, based on the based on the number and complexity of the operations that's uh, executed on that contract i don't know do you think this is understandable well i think um it is but i think people um might need a practical example like what you know you, you said that this is a, a world computer what what do we use this world computer to do okay so this let's, let maybe let's start from uh, from the big picture so as you can imagine since since the, the whole platform of, of Ethereum is like, is just think of it as a computer language in a, in a, in a, in a generic sense. So you can ask the same question, what, what does a computer language do for us and what is it good for? 
and you know, I mean, the, the boring answer is, well, you can use it for anything. You can build anything. You can build a game, or you can build a, you know, a, a system uh, proving calculations in in a in a particle accelerator or something like this. So well, we already have anything. computers that do these things. Yes. Uh, why is why is this why is this special? Why do we want to uh, to have actually a, even a sluggish and and redundant version of that? Why do I say that it's redundant and sluggish? Because as I said, if when you run the Ethereum uh, virtual machine on every single node of a network, then what does it do? Basically, you have the same calculations run over and over by everyone in the network. Why does it make sense? You could ask the question. And uh, of course, that's part of the how, how the consensus is, is secured in the, in the network. Uh, that's, that's part of the, 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 the how the system is secured. And so why, why would you want that? And of course, the answer is the same as the, what what we uh, what we would answer in the case of Bitcoin, why would we need decentralized money? So the central, so we can go back to the back to the Bitcoin origins of, of the whole blockchain technology. The uh, the answer is that we want to do away without with, without uh, central third parties in a in a in a in a lot of cases. So if you think about the current world, a lot of businesses are um, basing their revenue on on somehow inter being intermediaries in in transactions that the the value of which really is the transaction between between endpoints between people just think about ebay think about uber airbnb just eat or i don't know what the other countries have for takeaway services like food and and uh, also also think about google facebook or the social media sites what they do basically is is a, is a service that can in under like most most uh, aspects of their service can be automated in the first case and and therefore uh, there's no reason why we would for example trust our data and usage practices and, and profiles on on, on, on on this on these intermediaries I mean we can we can go into more details about all these examples but uh, the main point to take home, the main message to take home, is that a decentralized application platform allows to redefine these businesses as smart contracts, which means that we can disintermediate these uh, kind of rent-seeking middleman businesses. Uh, why, why, why would we want to do that? You can ask. I mean, in the, in the in the cases of Google and, and Facebook, you would have several reasons, r somewhat related to privacy as well, which we might or might not want to go into. But the main point is that most of these businesses capitalize on their uh, on the fact that they have a locked-in uh, mass adoption, basically, uh, kind of they they manage to get through a network effect and and build up a user base and because of the relatively high switching costs, they can lock in their uh, users. And it's, uh, it's well, they, 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 can, they can get away without improving their service. Like, let, let's, be, let's be euphemistic here. Mm -hmm. Let's not say that they are, because uh, sometimes I find, I find Uber and Airbnb extremely useful, but it has to be said that they they take uh, quite extreme and cheeky profits from uh, from the service providers that they that they uh, cater for. They and also have the ability to censor the results or present things to the user in a way that uh, suits their own interest versus maybe the general interest. I'm quite excited to to, and it's starting to take shape for me what Ethereum might be able to do in terms of disintermediating companies like Uber and Airbnb. And Thank Facebook. you for bringing it up. I exactly. So these are, these are two other reasons why we want to maybe intermediate some of these businesses or maybe that would be advantageous for, for, for actu actual people like users and, and service providers. So one was, uh, as I said, that there's an opportunity to cut the costs to basically drive the cost to, to, to the marginal actual cost of, of uh, maintaining these, uh, 
these uh, automatable services. I mean, uh, just just a side remark here. It's it's not so obvious. Maybe we can turn to the return to the issue, like for example, taking the example of remittance businesses, uh, because that's an interesting area. Maybe we can talk about that a little. So, which which kind of proves the fact that it's not always so easy to 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 automate these these middleman services. But so the two other reasons that you that you brought up can be one is censorship censorship resistance. And uh, the other one is uh, is uh, basically the the weakness due to the to, to the same feature which is usually called in the in this word crypto word the single point of failure issue. So so when when you have uh, uh, the the dependence of a service or a whole you know area of uh, of, of use dependent on a on a single company. Uh, ultimately, maybe related to uh, a few, a handful of individuals, then you always have the danger that uh, if they do something controversial, then uh, authorities or power that be can influence them. They can go corrupt. Uh, they can they can be captured, or simply they can they can die. This they, they, their server can uh, their service can uh, can fail. I mean, of course, this is a little bit naive because these days we have distributed data centers that in, in most of these businesses are really big, like what we talked about. So there's not, not a real danger that this infrastructure will be uh, easily destroyed. But on the other hand, they can be infiltrated by evil players like the NSA and, you know, or or the other yes, side of... Name your three-letter yeah. agencies. <laughs> favorite agencies. And uh, so, so any any issues that relates to the problem of single point of failure, or or, or gen more generally, kind of a pyramidal structure of like hierarchical control, uh, has has certain features that we have to reckon with, and the opportunity to decentralize most of these services basically does away without with with like can can handle these these problems. So you can imagine that with a with a distributed decentralized application, you can have the same uh, functionality as some of these examples that I mentioned, but without censorship. So, so like have, have them censorship resistant and also basically fault tolerance or zero downtime uh, right. properties. So this basically takes the services that are currently provided by companies, for example, Uber, Airbnb, Google, Facebook, and recreates the computing power that delivers the services that those companies provide, but in a totally automated and um, uh, censorship-proof and uh, high, high uptime, high availability fashion. Yeah, and most importantly, m m for the marginal cost. So uh, much much lower cost, because because it's a, uh, Ethereum is also an open architecture system. Uh, so uh, if if you come up with a with a decentralized application and have your source code open, and you take a certain charge percentage for your service, most most of the time anyone can recreate this service for a lower cost, and and. Uh, Basically, have have the same user base because of the uh, minimal or close to zero switching cost on the on the Ethereum network. I mean, the result of that is obviously a little problem as well because you, you can struggle to 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 find out what what will drive businesses and what will be the main motivator of startups and and innovations in this in this sphere. So you have to be a little bit imaginative. And there's a lot of people working on and brainstorming about these issues. Well, the, the, the cost will approach zero in these businesses. And then the human beings that are currently helping deliver those services will have to find uh, new and more interesting things to do with their time. Mm -hmm. right? Because these, um, these businesses will, um, will be automated and, and approach free. Yeah, so, and, and he, he, it, is, it is the moment where we can drop in another buzzword, disruption. Yes. So these this, this, this technologies exactly for this reason have a, 
lot of potential to disrupt existing uh, industries. We, we haven't talked about banking yet, but obviously the, 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 the initial examples for the use of Ethereum was m mainly and, and still is mainly inspired by, by the financial services sector. And maybe one reason we didn't mention that is the, because I'm, 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 I'm a little bit less clued, clued about the financial industry than, than other things. Well, I, I think, um, you know, the financial industry is one of the only industries that we have not seen the same disruption, for example, in the, the advertising industry or in telecommunications or music. All of those industries have been disrupted by technology. Uh, banking has been a little bit slow to the party. I think there's a lot of uh, regulation. There's a lot of opaqueness in the uh, global financial world. And, um, and that's an understatement. I mean, no one really knows how the Fed works, for example, if you really think about it. Right, right. There's a lot of mystery behind those things. But uh, ultimately, one can imagine that uh, it really is just information management uh, in the case of uh, finance, you're really just keeping track of who owes who what and uh, maybe calculating interest and, and other things that seem to the logical mind like they're ripe for, um, for automation and for uh, openness. But uh, obviously there are a lot of vested interests that, uh, and, and rent-seeking behavior that benefits from the status quo. And, uh, you know, perhaps that's why we haven't seen the same innovation and disruption um, that we've seen in other industries, but I think that that day is, is coming. Exactly. I mean, as, as you mentioned, this is, I mean, obviously the, the, what, you, what you mentioned is that how, how they would benefit from this system is, is kind of just a superficial view. I mean, if you, if you think about it, how, how embedded and how, how much vested interest the current financial in institutions have in the, in the, in the current mon money system, and the the ways the way money issuance works and and uh, all the all these things like we can we can talk about for hours. Mm -hmm. uh, then then you see why there must have, might have been uh, uh, this incentive for them to to move and and use use the available technology to to base their businesses on or their automation. But as you say, the, the although they are late to the, late to the party, there's a there's a huge movement right now. And there's a major interest from from a lot of financial institutions and banks uh, about Ethereum. Uh, Indeed, yes, and, I've seen that. And um, if if you if you see the news, like for example, you see the RC R uh, R three mm -hmm. uh, consortium of uh, thirteen banks, which are already conspiring to to use the Ethereum technology and uh, build up a con consortium chain which is a type of private chain, it's not on the public network, and uh, use, that, use the blockchain technology and is specifically the Ethereum uh, platform to, um, not sure what exactly, but basically interbank settlements. And I wonder if those, that banking consortium has a total appreciation for the real tiger they have by the tail here, because this, this technology does have the possibility to totally disrupt their their industry uh, obviously they're getting involved they want to shape the future and how mm. these things work but um, if ethereum does live up to the vision at least as, as you and I have described it mm. um, lots of the toll booth mechanisms that they currently have in place uh, should go away and much much of the services should be uh, drawn down to their mar marginal cost of delivery, um, yeah. making it much easier for a banker to buy a BMW. What do you, exactly. what do you think about that? I mean, time will tell whether, whether there will be, um, you know, new businesses that take the place of current, uh, you know, the banks and, and, and provide the same services to, to actual people and users uh, using this technology or not. Uh, but as for the, as for the consortium chains for, for banks like as someone cynically uh, put on, on, on Twitter like wow Ethereum there's, there's this wonderful permissionless and public and uh, decentralized infrastructure Let, let's make it permissioned and private how great <laughs> <laughs> uh, so 
Yes, forget um, about the internet. We've got this intranet that's uh, really yeah. cool. <laughs> yes. So, so some people are really cynical about their 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 motives and and uh, they outright uh, claim that most banks just make this move because they they want to uh, ride the waves of hype around blockchain technology and uh, really missing the 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 actual potential and point of of having this the public blockchain and having a decentralized way of, of, of handling finances. Um, there can be a lot of uh, debate about this. Ultimately, uh, time will tell whether, whether banks can, can get away and provide useful services to people using this technology or whether they can be completely disintermediated yes. by, or by automated uh, services. Or not completely, but like at least to a to great part. Right. Time will tell, and uh, we've got a front row seat. Uh, we've got a, a very exciting lifetime to live, a whole career's worth of work to do. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see how it all unfolds. Yeah. But I, I want to switch gears a little bit. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're very lucky to have you here with us in Bali uh, so that we can pick your brain a little bit about what it's like to be a core developer on a world-changing open source project such as Ethereum. Uh, you, you spoke a little bit about how you discovered Ethereum and how yes. you got involved, and you started to talk about volunteering as, as you do on any open source project, but yeah. can you say a little bit about um, how you got started with Ethereum and how that started to play out and, and, uh, and how you became a, uh, basically integrated this into your career, into a paying career? Yes. Yes, uh, definitely. And maybe I can intermix with uh, this with a little bit of generic historic information about Ethereum, how it yes, how it please. evolved. So, as I as I mentioned, uh, Ethereum was f first presented by by the by its inventor Vitalik Buterin, uh, uh, a very young uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, living in Canada, and he he and uh, one some of the early founders. Uh, started working on on implementing the, the the first clients of ethereum and it it immediately generated a lot of interest and as i said in january when i when i kind of joined the the open source project there were already quite a few developers uh, forming a little halo or community around these these uh, founders so I, I found myself in a buzzing very enthusiastic community immediately and uh, Soon after that, uh, Gavin Wood, who was, who was the main academic brain behind uh, formalizing the, the, the Ethereum uh, white paper into, into something that was called yellow paper, that formed the, the basis of um, implementing the various uh, um, um, code bases uh, for, for, the, for, the, for this protocol that, that Ethereum is. And... Uh, for for about half a year, we we worked as as a as just another open source project, and uh, a lot of our uh, efforts were um, dedicated to trying to find out how to how to fund this project further. There were some early thinking that maybe we could involve like venture capital the usual way. Luckily, this idea was dropped in favor of a, a very innovative solution which involved crowdsourcing, uh, sorry, crowdfunding. And uh, that's what we did in the end. Uh, it, it's, it was called the Ether pre-sale. That was in, uh, happened in summer 2014. So what we did basically was offered developers the, the option to buy into uh, a future option for, for this token called Ether for Bitcoins. And uh, so, so what, what they did was you, you, could, you could buy an option to... to uh, own a portion of the of the initial issuance of Ether when the when the network comes al uh, live, uh, where if you paid in uh, a particular amount of, of bitcoins, and uh, with this method, with this pre-sale, uh, like a two e two week period, we managed to raise an equivalent of uh, eighty million dollars, and that was at the time the second biggest crowd-funded project in the world. So that was already quite an achievement. I was very proud to be part of that. And uh, uh, so soon uh, the landscape changed a little bit because uh, with this funding, it was it became possible to 
to fund the development and, and monetize the, the development and implementation efforts. And that's when, when uh, I was really lucky and I was picked by one of the early founders, Jeffrey Wilke, who, who was implementing the, the client, uh, Ethereum client in the Go programming language. And I was uh, one of the first uh, paid employees uh, of the Ethereum Foundation. And uh, I, s I started working for, for Jeff, who managed to pull off the amazing feat to, to uh, build the, the number one uh, and most used uh, Ethereum client to date. And uh, somehow things really developed organically. Jeff was himself not uh, exactly a uh, uh, seasoned leader at the time. It was like he didn't have too much of an experience leading a team, but uh, he's, a, he's a fantastic leader. And, and uh, um, for one reason or other, he managed to recruit some amazing talent and I come up with this, what, what I would really shamelessly call the dream team that uh, developed all these all these fantastic uh, pr product products not only not only the core system but also some of the uh, accompanying infrastructure of, of the of the ethereum ecosystem maybe we can talk about that a little bit later what else what else this whole project entails not only this this core client that that is the ethereum so uh, so as for me, uh, since since uh, the summer 2014, I've been a paid employee of the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, this this was not a very easy ride because the the foundation uh, spending was a was a little bit uh, lavish at times, and uh, it was not entirely clear because also because of price fluctuation of Bitcoin and and later Ether. It was not clear how how much uh, longer the, the foundation is able to monetize the development, and uh, uh, at the moment the, the situation is, seems a bit more rosy because of the recent r uh, price rise of ether. Well, I remember there were a few bumps in the road, uh, press press wise, a little bit of bad press, and that was before the actual platform came out. So people were there were some question marks. In, in the media, like, is this thing e really going to materialize? Is it going to live up to the, the expectations and I the mean, hype? And, and since that time, I think you guys have delivered. Yes, and, I mean, uh, it's there's no much more, there's much less uh, haze around what, what's really there. Yeah, I think uh, in some of the early doubters, uh, yeah, no, no surprise there was some doubt, because, like, the, the first promises of, uh, of the uh, timeline for uh, specifically the the time when we plan to uh, launch the the live network was delayed by at least a quarter of a year, mm -hmm. uh, e even if we <laughs> kind of generous with the <laughs> with the with the estimations. So there was a lot of doubt whether it will ever be uh, will ever happen. Of course, I, I I was in the middle of developing the software, so I I, I never had any doubt when we we're, we're gonna do it. But uh, certainly there was. Like with any software project, there was over optimistic estimations let's mm -hmm. let's put it uh, euphemistically and of course the the general uh, context was was also not very favorable for ethereum I mean, as i said the the whole idea of of having a, a platform that can uh, really support all these groundbreaking and revolutionary uh, applications is quite outlandish and quite uh, quite crazy to be honest and, and, and difficult to believe that you, you, you can do it it's quite ambitious it's quite, it's quite ambitious and and since then definitely both both the, the success of and 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 you know security features and and development of the network like proved proved its worth as well as uh, we have a very enthusiastic and and loyal community which really is worth mentioning it's very active on on, on reddit and other forums and, and of course, the in endorsement of of big uh, big names like Microsoft, uh, IBM, and and for and all the banks uh, forming part of the R3 consortium are all testimony that 
we probably not just a, not just uh, vaporware and and uh, just a big promise, but maybe maybe it can actually be used for something really groundbreaking and useful. Yes, I, I think the future is looking much brighter than it was at a certain point in time. Yeah. And also the the recent price rise in ether, the token that you mentioned, yeah, has, has also gone up in value. Maybe perhaps reflective of that optimism amongst the community and, and what's possible. Perhaps. Of course, this, as, as this is a market, we never know. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of hype and, and, you know, media has a lot of influence on how the price goes. And it's, it's difficult to say whether it's based on anything objective. To be honest, I mean, me, uh, you know, sitting on the team and, and knowing the development uh, um, milestones, I'm, I'm kind of smiling a little bit because... I think all this major price rise was even before we, we, even we we announced to the community that some of our major milestones might be coming soon. Uh, maybe I'm not breaking too much of a secret, but we're gonna have a light client, for example, which allows for for uh, any node to join the Ethereum network without the without this major capacity and and the resource requirements of a full node. What does this mean that? Uh, it's similar to the to the Bitcoin simple payment verification uh, system. SPV so wallet. yes, so so a light client is basically allowing uh, mobile applications to use Ethereum without having to store uh, like gigabytes of data and calculating and do all the calculations that the normal node does with with relatively little compromise in security. Uh, sorry, if compromising security already sounds a bit deterring for 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 people, but that just means that you you don't necessarily have to be completely trustless, uh, as 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 the system of Ethereum uh, essentially allows you to be. It's the same as Bitcoin. What does this mean? That with a normal full node and client, all you need to know is the genesis block, so the basically the first seed when the network was started, and when you join the network, you can se you can securely verify all the transactions and and be a dub the blockchain all the way to the to the current without up to having the status an copy of the without blockchain. without having the copy of the blockchain and with uh, completely uh, securely verify the current state of the system without knowing and trusting anyone. Right. And and with the light light client, uh, this this is somewhat eased this this requirement. And you have to trust a certain point in the past, or some s certain nodes in the network, to to get the data from. And uh, you and from then on, once you trust them, you can choose any arbitrary uh, degree of security, meaning that you can choose to verify all the transactions, or choose to verify uh, transactions and and computations relating to uh, your chosen set of accounts, your account and your your wallet, etc., etc. But the, the short story is that this light client makes it more accessible to a larger audience. Correct. And makes it more useful. The, the big picture is that, let's, si let's simplify it even more, like the, the big picture is that this will make it possible to have mobile applications using Ethereum network. And that's what is really the, the key to mass adoption, I think. Because everyone lives on mobile, let's face it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the desktop is an interesting thing, but in more and more will be just a just a tool of the of the geek, mm -hmm. and uh, and and mobile is where things are happening. That's that's where people are are going to use for most most intents and purposes, right. and uh, that that's why the light client is important. And there's there's also a lot of other uh, uh, components of the uh, Ethereum vision and infrastructure that maybe we should mention. Do you think it's a good time yes, to, yes. to go into them? What are they? So, so quite from from early on, actually, it's maybe interesting to mention the history of, of Ethereum. So, when when Vitalik was first started to think along the lines of generalizing the blockchain, uh, he w that's 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 when he first met projects like Namecoin and especially Mastercoin, which were the first kind of pioneers in trying to think of uses of Bitcoin blockchain uh, beyond the obvious financial transaction and started realizing that the blockchain can be used to record and uh, uh, record events of certain certain data structures and uh, in a in a temper proof way 
uh, that that can you know be, be basically prove prove uh, timestamps and etc etc. So it can be used for registries of smart property and uh, for Name example space. names space and etc. And uh, uh, so much so that the first you know signature use of Ethereum was was uh, Namecoin uh, uh, was the implementation of Namecoin, which is nothing else but the DNS system, which uh, registers domains, and that was longer like a favorite of in the Ethereum world because it can be the whole whole of Namecoin can be implemented with a few lines of code in on, on the Ethereum platform, and uh, therefore it made very good T-shirt. Uh, uh, right, and it was yeah, obvious uh, the the power of the Ethereum. Yeah, it's, it's very well demonstrated that if all altcoins can be implemented in few lines of code, then it it was a very good indication that Ethereum is a is a very general framework, and also it has a very obvious ease of use that can be well demonstrated. Actually, uh, right now I'm wearing also a, 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 an Ethereum. T-shirt, and on my back maybe maybe Gary, if, if I turn around I can't because of the microphone. But you can see that there's basically a remit remittance business smart contract implemented on my back. Oh, okay. uh, so you've got the remittance problem solved on the back of your T-shirt. That's good to know. <laughs> ish, 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 ish. <laughs> kind of sort. Uh, so, uh, so from very early on, then uh, people started to realize the the real power of Ethereum goes well beyond the, the initial uh, use cases which were, you know, uh, by name registration or, or, or obviously financial, certain financial instruments like uh, multi-signature wallets. And people already started very early to think about uh, this, this other buzzword that I have to drop in now, the decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. Uh, which are very important. Maybe we should talk about it, it, it later in a little bit more detail. But the, the, the main point I'm, I'm going to uh, raise here is that uh, Gavin Wood came up with this uh, notion of Web3 and realized that Ethereum can be used as, a, as the backbone of the whole new crypto 2.0 vision of, of, eth eth of the Internet. So... so Basically, what we always wanted the internet to be a, a, a decentralized system that allows direct peer-to-peer tra -peer transactions now can be based on the Ethereum platform. So he came up with the, with the whole vision of how this infrastructure might work and how certain so-called base layer services could, could uh, complement Ethereum and form the basis of, 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 of the next web. A new internet. A new internet. So... As, as you can imagine, like the, the major ca calculations and uh, all, the, all the data structures that need public consensus could live on the Ethereum blockchain, and that, that's why it could form the, 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 the main most important base layer or backbone of the, of the new internet. I mean, this would solve like domain resolution, uh, all the, all the, all the uh, digests or, or proofs of the current state of many systems as well as provide a possibility for f financial transactions like uh, tra actual compens like mo monetary compensation for services as well as uh, identity services so there's no more boring logins for each and every service that you're using anymore because you, you, you just use one identity and it's it's always your identity. Yes. Or, or you can use several identities, but I mean, the main point is that you don't have to fill in those forms for every website. Because there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an interoperability and this synergy built into this Ethereum ecosystem. And, and there would be like, according to this vision, there would be two more kind of important pillars or, or base layer services that would complement Ethereum to, to give you the Web3 vision. One is... Uh, Whisper, an anonymized messaging system that would allow nodes to communicate with each other in a in a potentially uh, anonymous human ways. Human beings and machines communicating. Yeah, it it it, it, it will allow it will allow uh, these autonomous uh, agents to send messages to each other and uh, privately, presumably. Uh, yeah, and and also like obviously humans behind 
behind notes can can also send messages to each other and advertise things. It's a bit, bit less, less, less. You can you can think of it whisper as uh, as l less as a as a kind of Skype chat. It's more like Twitter-like advertising system uh, or like you know status publication system and. Uh, and the other pillar would be uh, a decentralized file storage and content distribution network that uh, we, we uh, called Swarm. And uh, that, that would allow uh, the whole internet, which is currently based on servers in data centers, to, 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 to have a serverless infrastructure. So Swarm would, uh, is ideally providing you a cloud service which is truly decentralized which which allows for upload to the cloud and uh, and download so basically serves serves file file and, and contents that that are currently hosted on particular servers uh, in a and in if it provides it in a decentralized way you would have the obvious same benefits that with ethereum you would have censorship resistance fault tolerance and and also like automatic scaling of popular content. So th this is this is the thing that I'm most interested in is this swarm infrastructure. Essentially, is it like uh, like Amazon Web Services? Like, but it, but instead of there being a company behind it, it's just the, the network providing uh, a file system and uh, and other basic services that allow the, the cloud to exist. Yes, it's basically the, the, the Amazon the Elastic Cloud, so to say. Uh, the Elastic uh, Cloud is the internet itself or the, uh, or the Ethereum network. Yeah, and the, the main difference is that when, uh, as opposed to having one particular app hosted on a, one particular server or several servers, but you know, still in a kind of centralized way, the, this content would be distributed and s would sit on random com random num num number of r random people's computers in a distributed way. There are several uh, similar infrastructures already e existing. This is not hugely dissimilar to BitTorrent, for example, or the Torrent network. And there's also like more modern improvements of, this, of the same idea of a distributed hash table-based uh, file storage system. One of them is called IPFS, the Interplanetary File System, which uh, in, uh, most likely will integrate with Ethereum quite uh, uh, strongly and, and closely. We'll be all set when we need to go to other planets. <laughs> 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 yes, with the help of Elon, with the help of Elon Musk, hopefully. <laughs> 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 yes, exactly. Well, and, and I think the the main point here is that these things almost become a public good, right? Instead of having to rely on corporations uh, to provide these things, that the the network itself provides these things for us and uh, can exist. Just based on the fact that all of us have a little bit of computing power in our hand, and we have connections to one another, if we deploy this code out into the into the uh, into the network, then um, the network can provide those services, and we don't have to rely on a single point of failure or a single company. Um, Correct. Correct. It's 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 exactly a public good, and uh, maybe it's a good opportunity to to talk about the politics of this a little bit. Because uh, as with all public goods, the, the problem is that who monetizes them and how, how, how the structure is maintained. And uh, especially in these kind of services of, uh, you know, the, uh, the good examples are uh, the, these, these crypto infrastructures like OpenSSL, for example, or like the early achievements of the cypherpunk movement in the 90s. Uh, the main problem with that was, as uh, very well explored, by Vinay Gupta, who, was, who, is, who is still one of the major evangelists of the Ethereum ecosystem. By the way, look, look, look him up on the, on, on the internet. He, he's got several videos on YouTube and, and several good writings. The, every word he says is, is golden, and I, and I don't use these praises unsparingly. So, uh, Vinay Gupta. Vinay Gupta. And uh, he, he pointed out in one of his, his closing speech of the, of the developers' conference in London in November, that one of the one of these problems with these uh, early projects was the, the lack of a, a clear structure of governance or, or a, a clear structure of, of, of governments and and monetization. So basically, the 
the institutional basis was not was not very well thought out, and second, at best, was uh, not easy to to maintain. And in with Ethereum, the the, the of course the problem is not solved, but there's an interesting uh, twist in in like kind of new potential avenues, because the Ethereum framework itself becomes a platform that can support uh, programming and automating these, these institutions themselves. And here is where we can get back to this idea that I dropped in already, the decentralized autonomous organizations. So uh, what are we talking about here? So you can uh, essentially program uh, the workings of a, of, a, of a little company on the blockchain with smart contracts. So if you think about it, what, what, what kind of things you need? You, you need a, a clear rules of, of who can be on the board or committee of decision making. Uh, they can be directly linked to, uh, to multi-signature wallets. What does that mean? For example, you can have institutional rules which say that seven of the 10 members of the committee has to agree uh, uh, on, on a particular amount of spending that the company has, uh, you can you can vote on on certain things that that the smart contracts controls, for example, certain certain assets, uh, you know, sales and everything that can be linked on the on the blockchain. So a lot of lot of these institutional practices can can actually be automated and and made transparent and public, uh, as well as uh, clearly automated on the, on the blockchain and these these are not necessarily guarantees but but these are de definitely make these definitely make it possible for for projects to 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 actually to, to, to allow a much uh, larger core collaboration uh, mm -hmm. pro projects with that require uh, for example crowdfunding can also be can, can also be, uh, for example, ca crowdfunded projects can also be at the same time uh, crowd-governed projects. So if you think about it, because because you can you can at the same time as buying into like a Kickstarter projects, you could buy your rights to to certain votes in in this organization, and uh, and therefore o automate uh, the workings of a of like a shareholder sh like. Yeah, that's fascinating. Like a public that's company, without, without uh, needing all the all the bureaucratic uh, hurdles that that the current system requires you to do. Is this, uh, in a certain sense, ceding control to the machines? Is this uh, is this Skynet? Is there, are we uh, giving away our, our human power to the machines? Here? Wow! Thank you for asking, Gary. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a common topos in the in the in the Ethereum community to think about these problems, and of course, I don't have a good answer to this, <laughs> and, and this is just interesting to talk about. But certainly, I mean, if you think about uh, uh, these autonomous agents uh, being able to hire people to do certain jobs because they can always pay out things, they can seek uh, profit, and they can be programmed to, to, to go into directions where uh, things are most profitable. Then some, for some people, these are major red flags and, and like big uh, the warning signs. And, and of course, especially if you combine it with the, with the prospect of how Ethereum is integrated with the Internet of Things and how, how you can have like self-repairing uh, uh, washing machines that <laughs> IBM uh, developed, leading into like self-repairing drones and uh, and right, uh, taxi cabs that can go get an yeah, oil change, and, that kind of thing. You know, and of course, like self-driving cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then you can imagine quite a utopistic or dystopic <laughs> world. <laughs> it's your choice, really. I mean, I'm I'm optimistic about about uh, the sanity of humanity of using these projects to the. To, to good ends, but then again, I might be naive. <laughs> well, I think I, I, I share your optimism, I, but I again, I'm kind of optimistic by nature, <laughs> and uh, I'm really excited by the possibilities. And um, well, there are a lot of things that human beings kind of get wrong based on human frailties, right? True, human <laughs> corruptibility, or even just humans' lack of attention to detail. To put to uh, maybe put it more kindly. Um, 
Like Certainly, but never forget that after all, nodes are still run by people, and uh, you know, s- still uh, machines can can still not run the world without humans, and uh, so. So just just to reassure your audience that, that <laughs> that's only until we, they turn us all into human batteries <laughs> and then plug, plug into the back of our head and feed us, you know, an alternate reality of the matrix. Like, but then again, then it's it, all over. But then again, <laughs> it might already be the case that we live in just oh, a virtual reality anyway. Batteries. Yes, you're right. Oh my, <laughs> <laughs> my head is spinning. Right. <laughs> well, um, that's that's about um, brings us to about the end of the time that we have. And I think that's a good note to go out on, to think about Mm -hmm. the future, to think about the good possibilities. Maybe uh, keep our eye on the potential bad things, but but keep our eye on the the positive things that are possible. And and, uh, and the revolutionary potential that Ethereum brings and... And or, or in general, uh, the, the 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 blockchain and decentralized applications and platforms can bring, and the uh, and the and the potential change that you know, society can see as a result of allowing uh, uh, the the long tail of involvement, like basically democratization of a lot of uh, service in, in the provision of a lot of services, as well as the the rise of. Uh, directness in peer-to-peer transactions without without uh, rent-seeking middleman businesses. This is, uh, this is this is this is something something really big. It is it is, and we're going to see the results in our lifetime. And how exciting that uh, you're right in the thick of it, yeah. right, working on these very things. I feel super lucky. That's awesome. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for spending a little bit of time this afternoon. And i um, really happy that uh, you decided to visit Bali. And, thank you uh, very much, Gary. And uh, this was a very fun conversation. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. All right.